good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Stephanie Cole, and I'm joined by Dr. Lucretia Santa Anna, Memorial Hermans affiliated colon and rectal surgeon. Thank you for joining us. Thank today. you for having me. <laughs> so, March is Colon Cancer Awareness Month, and we're here to answer your questions about colon cancer prevention and detection. So, we'll dive right in. Let's do it. Okay. <laughs> Um, first of all, how does colon cancer start, who typically gets it, and what are the risk factors? Okay, great question. <laughs> so first of all, anybody can get colon cancer. Um, we group colon and rectal cancer together, so we're doing colon and rectal cancer awareness. Um, and we have, it starts from a little polyp. So it's a little abnormality inside of your colon that can take years to become a cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the uh, biggest, I guess the misinformation a lot of people think is if I don't have symptoms, I don't have bleeding, then I don't have cancer. And that's not true. Um, a tiny little polyp will be completely asymptomatic for up to 10 years even. Wow. Uh, cancer can be completely asymptomatic. And that's where colon and rectal cancer starts. So very easy to to treat if you catch it early. Exactly. Um, so risk factors. Risk factors, so number one, smoking. So stop smoking. <laughs> um, and I'm sure you hear that from any uh, healthcare provider. It's the number one link to almost every cancer that we can imagine. Um, the other uh, highly implicated um, cause of colon and rectal cancer is diet. You know, we're not eating good, healthy diets. Uh, a lot of our diets have uh, carcinogens, we're breathing carcinogens, um, we have a lot of processed foods, and so all of that is sitting in our colons. Um, after we digest it, it sits in our colon, and then it just slowly goes through until obviously we have a bowel movement. And so all of that is exposing the mucosa on the colon to carcinogens. So what I always recommend is a high fiber diet. Add a fiber supplement like uh, Metamucil or some sort of psyllium so you can bulk the stool move it through, and then you have less exposure to your colon. Um, is it 100% implicated? No, but there is a high relation of diet and colon cancer. What about probiotics? Probiotics are good. Um, that, that helps more to replenish your good uh, bacteria. We all have a lot of bacteria in our colons, and probiotics help keep a healthy flora. So that's always a good, good additive. All right. So can you walk us through the different stages of colon cancer? Sure. So our goal is prevention. Of course. And um, the first thing, the first stage would be a colon polyp. And that's a precancerous polyp. Um, we remove it with a colonoscopy and then you're done. You will never get cancer in that polyp. Amazing. Um, stage one, so that stage one has already uh, become a cancer. So it's an inv invaded some of the uh, submucosa in your colon. And that would require surgery, but surgery would be curative. Then there's stage two. So that's the um, invasion of the tumor is a little bit thicker. It's already gone into the muscle wall of your colon. Okay. That would require surgery. And then some people would require chemotherapy. Um, we actually look at the molecular studies of the actual cancer and decide if that person would uh, benefit from chemotherapy or not. The third stage is stage um, three where it has already gone out into the lymph nodes. Um, so the first place where colon cancer will leave the actual colon wall and head is into the lymph nodes. Okay. Um, and those people will require surgery to remove that piece of colon and they would require chemotherapy afterwards. Um, that is still for curative intent. Um, then there's stage four. Stage four means it has already spread to other organs. Um, at that point, we, we can't necessarily cure the cancer, but we can uh, treat it palliatively to control symptoms and hopefully control disease to give a good quality of life that is longer than, than it used to be with stage four. And what organs does colon cancer typically spread to? The uh, most common organ it spreads to would be the liver. So prior, once we have diagnosed you with uh, colon cancer, which is done by colonoscopy, then we look at um, CT scans to look at your, your chest, abdomen, pelvis, and liver, then lung, is also another common place that colon cancer would metastasize to. And you spoke a little bit about the different treatments based on the stage of cancer when a person is diagnosed, but could you go into a little bit more detail about the different sure. treatments? Sure. So for um, precancerous, 
If we can get it out through an endoscopy, that's a 30 minute procedure. We remove the polyp, you go home that day, the next day you're back at work, no problems. So that's our prevention of colon mm -hmm. cancer. Uh, once we actually have to do surgery, now we, um, we do it robotically, which is a minimally invasive technique. Um, we, it's not the robot doing the surgery, I'm still doing it, so that's a lot of a misconception that people think something else is doing the surgery, but we control, as surgeons can control the robot, we're able to get into smaller, tighter areas, have better visibility, um, so less damage to surrounding tissues, uh, recovery is better for patients. You're still in the hospital two to four days after surgery. Um, once you recover, you go home, um, you're pretty much eating a regular diet, um, activity is limited, um, but most people are back at work within a month. Okay. Um, so it's a good recovery, but again, the whole goal at this point is, is prevention. Definitely. What are the side effects of colon cancer treatment? So for surgery, side effects are pain, possible infection. Um, chemotherapy, if it is a stage two on, in some cases and stage three, um, th there are side effects. People feel fatigue. Um, you can have constipation, diarrhea, um, uh, neuropathy. Um, so uh, problems with uh, the fingertips or the, your toes. So there are some side effects that you know, aren't pleasant, uh, but clearly we're doing this for cure and so it, it's worth the treatment. Of course, of course. So what are the different screening methods that can be used for colon cancer? Okay, so this is a, a great question because everyone always comes in and says, oh, I've already checked my, blood, my stool for blood and there's no blood, so I'm done, I'm good. I have no family history, so and I have no symptoms, I don't need to get anything done. Um, and I always, you know, kind of shrug my shoulders and, and hate to be harsh, but I don't care. I don't want to hear that. Um, you know, we have the gold standard um, screening tool, which is a colonoscopy. Right. Um, it's the only cancer I can prevent in somebody. Um, if everybody were getting colonoscopies the way we have recommended, we wouldn't be seeing colon cancer. Um, but unfortunately, only 30% of people are getting screened appropriately. So it's, it's the best screening tool we have, and less than half of the population is actually taking advantage of it. Um, it's a pretty easy procedure. You, the day before, you have to prep, clean out your colon, mm -hmm. which nobody likes to do, but there are worse things in life. Um, and then the day of the procedure, you're asleep. You, you don't feel anything. You won't remember anything. Um, it takes about 20, 30 minutes. You wake up, and now we can pretty much guarantee if you stay on top of the recommendation of doing your colonoscopies, you're not going to get colon cancer. That's amazing. And I can actually speak to, I've had colonoscopies annually for 10 years because um, I was third in my family to have ulcerative colitis. It's just grandfather, mother, and me, and really the prep, as long as you, you know, talk with your physician and hopefully can get a, a prep that's easier on you, mm -hmm. and I do two days of clear liquid diet instead of just one. Great. It's, it makes it so much easier mm -hmm. on me. And and you're not going to starve. No. Uh, it's you're not, not going to die. It's, it's, tall. it's doable for I wasn't anybody. aware of that statistic that only 30% of people mm -hmm. that it's should shocking. be screened. I mean, for a little bit of discomfort, it's so exactly. not worth it. And you can and catch that's it people's so fear. early. And that the people's fear is that day of prep. Yeah. Which you've done plenty. You should. <laughs> I have tried every prep under the sun. I'm telling you. It's, it's There's really one for you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Exactly. Just as long as people don't try to be the hero and go back to work right after so they don't do the anesthesia. Right. Exactly. That's right. Yes. Right, Modern day right. medicine has good anesthesia to make it <laughs> yes. comfortable for all of us. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, okay. So when should one be screened for colon cancer? So we always recommended starting at age 50, and as of just over a year ago, that recommendation changed. So now we um, have lowered the age to 45. Um, part of the reason is we're seeing younger people with colon and rectal cancer. Um, I've seen people as young as 20-year-olds, um, which is unheard of, but, um, but that's why anytime someone has symptoms, rectal bleeding, changes in bowel function, um, new onset abdominal pain, something just doesn't seem right, get checked. There's right. no reason not to. Um, you, nobody 
thinks they have cancer. Nobody wants to have cancer, but if there's something that's changed in your GI tract, you need to get checked. If you feel completely normal, everything feels perfect, no family history, you start at 45. Yeah, that's great. Um, so if a family member had colon cancer, when should one start their screenings? And um, that's another great question because uh, family, histor family history is related to about 15% of colon cancers. So it's a much smaller percent than most people think because mm -hmm. um, that's the other <coughs> reason people say, I don't need a colonoscopy. I've never had anyone in my family with colon or rectal cancer. Um, but like I said, less than 15% is actually familial. If there is a family history, you need to have your colon screened, everyone in the family, 10 years before that patient was diagnosed. So let's say your father got diagnosed with colon cancer at age 50. Now everybody needs to start it by age 40. Got it, okay. Um, do I need a physician referral to get a colonoscopy and what types of physicians can practice these or perform these colonoscopies? The, um, this is part of maintenance uh, healthcare. So usually you do not need a um, referral from a physician to get a colonoscopy. Um, different insurances are different and they change so frequently that I can't keep track of who would, who wouldn't. Right. Um, but you will need to see a specialist, either a gastroenterologist or a colon and rectal surgeon. Um, we're the ones that do uh, all of the, most of the colonoscopies and the screening. Um, some insurance companies require you to go through your PCP to get the referral. Um, a lot of us also offer a um, um, open access where you can call our office, you speak to one of our nurses, and if you meet all of the criteria, we give you the prep, we see you the day of the colonoscopy, that way you don't have to do extra visits mm -hmm. uh, to the office. It just makes it a lot easier for access and to get everyone screened appropriately. Got it. Um, and then, are there any dietary or lifestyle changes that will influence my colon cancer risk? Yes, so one, stop smoking. Uh, number two, fiber. Okay. Um, the recommendation is 30 grams a day. That's like eating 10 apples a day. So good luck <laughs> with just diet alone. Um, I always recommend adding fiber. Add 10 grams of a fiber supplement and you're already a third of your way into your re recommendation. Even if you don't feel you need it, it does uh, help clean out your colon better um, and it just decreases the exposure time of carcinogens to your colon. Um, exercise is always great. It gets okay. good blood flow, improves your bowel function, and um, staying in a healthy weight. All right. Well, thank you very much. Of course, my for pleasure. For sh sharing all of this valuable information with our audience, and thank you for tuning in. If you are interested in scheduling a screening colonoscopy or an appointment with one of our affiliated physicians to discuss your individual risk, please click on the link in our post and have a great day. Thank you.